you know, as a broad category of impactful research findings, I think the ways that we've learned how to treat this disease without having to use systemic corticosteroids and without having to use elemental formulas have been huge in terms of patient therapy. I, mean, I remember when I first started taking care of this disease, it was really hard because the options were kind of prednisone elemental formula and maybe a Flovan inhaler, but if you were a little kid, you couldn't do that. You couldn't coordinate that puff swallow technique. Um, and it was really hard to take care of these patients because there weren't that many options. When the six food elimination diet came along and Kaga Wallace Group described that in 2006, that was huge because we all started using that and it works. It really does work in, um, depending on the literature that you would use, anywhere from 53 to 74% of the time. It works in children, it works in adults, and it is certainly a lot easier than using an elemental formula. So I think that has been um, very impactful. And I think it's actually taught us a lot about the disease pathogenesis in that it seems to be a food-driven disease in a lot of adults too. And I think we didn't have that concept until Nimi Gonzalez and Iko Hirano did their studies in adult patients. So I think that has been very meaningful. Um, I think that the studies that have been randomized placebo controlled trials with the topical corticosteroids, both in adults um, and children, using fluticasone or using budesonide that's either nebulized and swallowed or made into a slurry, have been really impactful um, because it's given patients another route by which to use a topical medicine to treat their disease. So a disease in 2003 that felt really hard to take care of now in 2012 feels like we don't have all the answers by a long shot and we still don't know maintenance and things like that, but we know how to get rid of it pretty easily. So I think that has been huge. Um, so that's kind of a broad category of things that I think have had a large impact. Um, the other things I think that are coming down the pipeline that will have huge impacts on our patients are things like Dr. Faruda's string test. Um, one of the problems um, with this disease is that we, they, the patients keep having to have endoscopies with biopsies. And in children, it's an, it's an invasive procedure in anybody, but in children, it requires general anesthesia. It's hard to want to have your child have an endoscopy. It's hard for you as a, an adult to want to go in and get a scope over and over and over again. And yet, as your physicians, that's what we tell you you have to do so that we know if your esophagus is healed or not. So I think as a diagnostic modality, we may or may not ever use a string test. But for the maintenance part of the disease, once you have the diagnosis, to be able to just swallow a string, pull it out, that is so much less invasive. So I think the things that are coming down the pipeline that are less invasive or minimally invasive are going to be very impactful for patient care. Um, I think that the third category I'd say we've learned uh, quite a lot about really is kind of the disease pathogenesis. Um, and that's a super broad answer, but whether it's genetics in terms of TSLP um, and, and how that can be an underlying factor for the disease, or eotaxin-3 and how it is one of the most highly dysregulated genes. Um, I think although we don't know how to necessarily, we don't have an anti-eotaxin-3 molecule or an anti-TSLP molecule right now, I think our, to have that understanding is really important. And it's going to help us understand which patients have complications, which ones need, you know, maybe more therapy, less therapy. And I think as we understand more of the genetics and the, and the changes in gene transcription, that that will be helpful for us to develop new therapies.